Hi, everybody. It's me, Dr. Amanda Kemp. Welcome to uh, this session that we're going to do tonight on the A in my heart system for racial justice and mindful living. So what we're going to do for about 20 minutes, I'm going to um, first introduce myself a little bit more in case for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. And, um, and then I'm going to just share a little bit from my book to help set up what I mean by act with intention. So this is my book, Say the Wrong Thing, Stories and Strategies for Racial Justice. And, um, and then I'm gonna talk about the, the three strategies that, um, that I have used and, and that I've sort of you know pulled from the various actions that I've taken over time and um, share them with you so you can choose which ones you wanna use. And the big point here tonight, acting with intention is about being aware, self-aware about what you're up to and what you're up for. You know, what does your body need? What does your nervous system need? And what can you do? What are you choosing to do? How are you choosing to use your power? So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I have a PhD, I'm a graduate of Stanford University, and I'm the founder of the Heart System for Racial Justice and, all, and um, Mindful Living. And a lot of times people don't put mindfulness and racial justice in the same category or in the same lane, but I do, because um, I think that if we're really going to be in the struggle for justice over the course of our lifetimes, then we need essential practices of self-care and self-awareness so that we don't burn out from our anger or sort of just wilt out from our despair. Um, so we, or harm other people in the course of standing for justice. So for me, mindfulness is an essential sort of array of tools that I bring to bear in the work that I do. So that's me, and I invite you, if you're interested in finding out more, you can check me out on my website. Um, I guess I could type that in here. I'm still learning how to use this program. You can check me out on my website, or you can um, just you know, Google my book, Say the Wrong Thing. Okay, so let's move on to act with intention. In my book, I, t I quote Ricardo Levins Morales, who is like one of my huge mentors right now. Ricardo is a political cartoonist. He's Puerto Rican, grew up in Chicago, hard, hard times in Chicago in the 60s and 70s, and is now one of these elders in the movement, um, longtime political organizers, uh, who sees himself as also healing. And I guess that's why I love him, because I see the work I do is not, quote, political, but as heart work and as healing work and recovering, helping us, those who have had our power stripped from us, helping us to recover from trauma. And that's one of the things that Ricardo talks about. He says that uh, to him, trauma is um, at its essence, a loss of power. Someone taking away your ability to protect yourself or to act in your own, on your own behalf. And when we lose that ability to protect ourselves or protect our children, um, we feel shame and pain. And, um, and we do things to try to psychologically cope with that loss of power. So if you look at it on a collective level, you could say the pain and the shame of slavery, of Jim Crow, of segregation, of, of, of watching uh, black men and women, adults be um, denigrated in front of their children, um, men losing a sense of their manhood in front of women who they can't protect or who they have to sort of um, negotiate white supremacy. Uh, it, there's just a group level loss of power amongst African Americans. We've been stripped um, of our birthright to care for ourselves and to take care of ourselves and our children, our families, et cetera. So Ricardo says that, so when this power has been stripped, people automatically, they move to Medicaid. And um, the way our system works in this country under capitalism, 
there are certain things that are readily available to help us medicate. But those things don't actually help us to get strong. They help to numb us out um, or to distract us from our pain so that we're angry and we're yelling at our kids or we're picking fights with people in our organizations. Um, you know, I was in a meeting once where there was a young woman, a young black woman who just went off on someone in the meeting. And later as I was talking to her, it was because her partner had just been, you know, stopped by the police and, um, and she was just sort of fed up to hear with the institutional racism. And we were in a meeting where there was just some kind of, I'm just gonna call it some kind of clueless whiteness going on. And she just had no patience for it. And, um, and so she went off and at the end, um, you know, when we talked, I realized it, it was that pain um, that was driving her and um, her, uh, her inability to medicate, to take care of that pain made it hard for her to be in an organizing situation across race lines. But I also wanna say that even when we're in predominantly black situations, the pain of, ha of being stripped, of dealing with our um, degradation has us harming each other. And if we are not aware of that harm, then we think I'm upset because so-and-so said something, you know what I mean? Rather than um, really looking at the institutional context in which I am, you know, mad with so-and-so because, you know, whatever they did at the meeting or they didn't come to the meeting or something like that. So the point that I'm making here is that um, when we get stripped of power, we medicate, we try to reclaim it. And a lot of the ways in which we medicate, if we're not awake, will cause more damage or harm, either by distracting ourselves with substances, you know, it could be sugar, alcohol, other kinds of, you know, drugs, or um, video games, just, you know, social media, it's just deadening kind of stuff, right? To distract and numb ourselves. Um, or we blow up at people and we think it's about them, but really it's about more about the context or something ongoing um, that's having us feel so angry or um, not have a capacity for compassion for other people who are our allies or who we are in the same organization with moving towards the same goals. So in this piece in my book, when I say act with intention, one of the things that I ask us to do is to intentionally take care of ourselves, intentionally build in uh, practices of self-compassion so that even when things go badly or they're tough amongst our organizing community, we have some capacity to be resilient. You know, it won't break us and it won't make us have to go out and break the organization <laughs> that we're a part of. So, and when I talk about self care and self-compassion, uh, those were, that's where I'm bringing the tools of mindfulness. And so one of the things that's been really lovely for me is the um, metta meditation. And metta is, it's just this beautiful repetition of, of, of loving phrases. And the one that I use goes something like this. So I'll like quiet myself. I'll take a deep breath. <sighs> And I encourage you to do the same thing. If you're with me now, just go ahead and take a deep breath. And you would just say to yourself, may I be well, may I be happy, may I be safe and strong, may I be well. May I be happy. May I be safe and strong. 
And so I will do some version of that meditation anywhere from five minutes to half an hour. I start with myself and then I move out to someone that I love. It could be my dog. Some days it's my child. Some days it might be my sister or my husband. And then from the, that person, you know, say may, if I'm saying it, if I'm building up love inside of me for let's say my husband, I say, may he be well, may he be happy. May he be safe and strong. Um, and then I'll move on to someone who I don't know well. They say a neutral person. And then finally, I'll extend that loving kindness to someone who I have a difficult relationship with or who, who brings up difficult feelings inside me. And the whole purpose of the meta, in my opinion, is to generate that sense of well being, safety, and goodness inside of me, even though the larger culture, tends to promote violence and um, judgment and, you know, criticism. So a regular practice with metta just builds up a kind of peaceful resilience inside you. So, and that takes me to the last thing I want to talk about tonight, which are these strategies for, uh, ways to act with intention. So there are three strategies that come up in my book and that I talk more about in my classes or when I work with clients. The first strategy is to disengage, to take care of yourself. Uh, the second strategy is to challenge. Um, and this is usually for a public situation. It could be to challenge an authority, um, not with the aim of changing the authority's mind, but with the aim of reaching out to and speaking to the audience that you care about. And then the third strategy is to lean in. And this is more of a one-on-one -on -one strategy where you get to tunnel down to common values, even where you um, have different narratives. So Ricardo, who I love, says, you know, he doesn't believe in building bridges. He believes in digging down deep to find the bedrock of our common values. Um, and that's the foundation of our ability to have um, solidarity with each other and to see our commonality. I really like that too, because it feels more grounded um, than a bridge and less like stretching. It's not stretching. It's just sinking down deeper and deeper. So, okay, so let me briefly describe what do I mean by disengage to take care of yourself. So if someone is saying some, you know, misogynistic, racist, bull crap, maybe something anti-trans, what have you, you have a choice. You can engage the person or you can disengage and take care of yourself. I think it's totally honorable to disengage. If you don't really want to talk with the person, um, if you don't really care about them, if you are feeling like, okay, I'm really tired, I'm hungry, uh, I'm irritated, I don't believe in sacrificing yourself to have a conversation with every, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry who wants to, you know, lay out some racist crap to you. I. Perfect. I think it's perfect and beautiful to do something affirming to take care of yourself. So I do my meta meditation, but you could also um, take a bath. You could, uh, in my case, you know, you could be go and be in the presence of other black people and black art. You can listen to music. I just want you to, when you're in the, in, when you get, you know, in the presence, when you're breathing in or you've been splashed by somebody's racism or homophobia, I don't want you to just walk away. I want you to walk away and take care of yourself because something toxic has been sent to you. So I want you to keep yourself um, strong and healthy by taking your good medicine. 
So that's what I would call the strategy of um, disengaging to take care of yourself. The second strategy, which is the challenging one, I'm going to stand up a bit because, you know, when you're challenging, you're, you, you kind of put yourself on stage. So um, I gave the example, uh, there's a, let's say there's a panel or you're at a public meeting, you're at the school board or um, you're somewhere, right, where some people have been given some authority. And you can choose to check in with yourself. I actually heard August, August Wilson, the late August Wilson, the amazing playwright. He was talking about how he went to a bank and they were giving him a hard time cashing his check when he was in L.A. And he said to himself, he would check in with himself. He said he would say to himself, August, are you willing to die today or are you willing to go to jail today? Because he was asking himself, how far am I willing to go in dealing with this racism that's coming up? So I just want you to ask yourself, just check in with yourself. Am I grounded? Okay, and if I'm grounded, and this is an issue where I want, there's an audience here that I wanna speak to, then I may stand up and say, um, you know, here's what I think is important, or here are the implications that you're missing. And I'm actually speaking to the room in my challenge more so than to the quote authority with whom I disagree. And the reason why I'm speaking to the room is because I um, am not going to try to get someone who may have a point of view that they're wed to or that they have somehow kind of ego egotistically bound to um, or who may have some other kind of investment in holding on to, let's say, something racist or misogynistic. Instead, I'm going to speak to the room because... Again, to quote Ricardo, what's more effective than speaking truth to power is speaking power to power. And in a space where there are multiple people, I want to, to pull people toward the truth that I'm embodying. And I want to empower that group of people to raise questions. So it's not the drama of, Amanda and an authority. It's a drama of Amanda speaking to a community that I care about to invite them to challenge with me the authority. So that's what challenging is. And the third strategy in terms of, for me, ways to act with intention is to lean in. And this is more of a one-on-one -on -one strategy. I write about this in my book. Uh, I was talking, you know, it's interesting. There was someone in a co-working space that I know, a white man who I could tell from various comments he made about race that he really wanted to engage me. And I really didn't want to engage his um, racism. You know, I didn't want to engage his um, defense his instinctive and unreflected defense of white supremacy. So, uh, so I just was not available whenever he wanted to talk. But event, but one day after I've been taking a bunch of self compassion and you know mindfulness things, so I had a whole bunch of nice stuff inside me. I just had some patience for him, and so he opened it up, and I just leaned in. I literally just listen and um, not to correct him or to make him wrong or um, really anything like that, but just listen deeply, kind of at the level that Ricardo talks about, going down to that bedrock and listening for and sharing back with him what I heard as those common values. And I also shared um, my narrative, you know, so uh, my narrative of this country having not been built on equality or on, quote, we're all immigrants or, um, you know, freedom. 
I, I mean, I shared my narrative, right? Um, but I had listened to him to such an extent that he had some capacity to listen to me. Now, in leaning in, I don't think I changed his mind. I don't know for sure. Um, but what I did was deepen a relationship so that there was a space to go back again at a later time or a space for me to send him, you know, a link to something later on or to invite him to take a course with me. So leaning in is a strategy for one on one. And it's a strategy for um, a longer term engagement. Like you are going to you care. So you're not trying to necessarily be right um, or stop a behavior that is harming other people immediately, which sometimes that's what we need to do. Leaning in is more like um, allowing yourself to see the humanity and just how close that other person is to you, even though we have fundamentally different narratives about, you know, what is America, you know, what it means to be human, you know. So those are the three strategies that I use. Um, I thank you for being with me today. If you would like to find out more about my heart system for racial justice and mindful living, um, please feel free to get in touch with me on Facebook at Dr. Amanda Kemp, or you can uh, send me an email from my website. I'd love to be in touch with you. I'm going to actually offer my first online course, small group coaching program this summer. So I would love to hear from you. All right, everybody. Peace and love. Take good care. Bye-bye.